Always be careful with these pickups. They're very prone to... Welcome back, troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. Today we're going to learn about the L6 Midnight Special. It's kind of a quirky mid-70s model that not everybody even realizes is out there, or they didn't realize that there were so many different iterations of these things. So to start this video off, I actually did a very in-depth video already covering the entire history of the L6S model. So definitely go ahead and check that out for all the nitty gritty details. But just as a quick overview here, in 1972, Bill Lawrence and Gibson, they partnered up and started designing what eventually became the L6S. It's at this time that Gibson introduced the L5S, the highest end solid body electric guitar at that time. And this is essentially the stripped down version of that. So if you think these are meant to be Les Pauls that were flattened into pancake shapes, no, they're more so styled after an L5, which is one of Gibson's highest end arch tops. In 1973, Gibson released the L6S, but one year later, they introduced something called the L6S Deluxe and then renamed the L6S to the L6S Custom. There were about 12,000 customs made because they were the most popular because they had a rotary switch, a mid roll off control, as well as a treble roll off. And then the deluxe version, there was about 3,500 of those. And then there's this one. This thing's kind of interesting. There's only around 2,000 of them out there. So that makes them the rarest of the L6S family. However, this is not actually an L6S. And if you go by Gibson advertisements, this guitar doesn't even exist. It was never officially in Gibson's catalog, unlike the other one. And it's called the L6 Midnight Special. It doesn't actually have the S in its official title. The phrase Midnight Special comes from a popular TV show. Now what makes this one interesting is it's more closely related to a deluxe. It has a string through body design, it has a toggle switch instead of the rotary and just a master volume, master tone with an output jack. Now the pickguard is still a little bit different. It has the L6S style custom pickup rings instead of the ones that have the extra adjustment here. So it's kind of like a blend of both of them, but then you, you get to this. <laughs> it's a bolt on neck. All the other ones are set neck in construction. So to kind of understand what Gibson was doing here, I mean, this is like the beginning of the Norlin era. In 1973, 1974, you're kind of a few years into it at this point. But this is when, you know, some cost saving measures were coming about. It's when things like this was birthed, as well as the Marauder, the S1, later on in early 80s, something called the Sonics. This is pretty much the first model that I'm aware of anyways, that Gibson actually utilized a bolt on neck. Now they've had subcategories within the Gibson name that used these way before then, but I truly do believe this is the first bolt on neck Gibson branded instrument. And it's kind of what I consider the road to the studio model that was eventually brought out in 1983. They were trying to produce cheaper guitars that would compete with other competitors. So they gave L6S, Marauders, S1s to all these famous people, like the Marauder. It's the famous Kiss Smash guitar. This one, one of the bigger names is Carlos Santana that used one of these. Apparently he hated his. So these are just kind of quirky things. They're not necessarily my favorite. I'm not a big fan of the L6S guitars, but my favorite iterations are the simple ones, the Deluxe and the Midnight Special. And another reason why I like these things a little bit is because you can find stock maple fret boards. There's also ebony and rosewood options out there. And another unique feature just to the Midnight Special is they don't actually have a headstock veneer. It's just the plain maple. So it's not black like all the other ones. Things to know about these guys, they are 24 frets, so that's a full two octave scale. That's something that was relatively new for Gibson at this time, as well as the whole bolt on neck thing. And they have that whole small nut width thing, which is great for small handed players. So let's go ahead, throw this one on the workbench, take a look at its individual parts before we get to a playing demo. Diving on inside here, we can see the backside of the Bill Lawrence pickups here. Now there's two common issues with these and always be careful if you're verifying the originality of these pickups because 
The lead wires are extremely thin. That's what these guys are right here. It's very easy to accidentally pull these off and then your pickup's broken. And you can't fix it because these are epoxy coated. Unless you were lucky and it broke right here instead of snapping clean off right there because then you can't splice it. The other issue that'll sometimes happen to tar back pickups as well as these is the back mounting plate will fall off. You can glue that back or epoxy it back, but those are two common issues with these things. So as far as within the circuit, the bridge pickup's reading about 7.5. It's then the neck is in similar territory and middle position, kind of half that around 4.2. Here's what the inside of the cavities look like. It's kind of interesting to see a screw hole right there. Not sure what that's about. That's what I'm talking about, guys. See? broke off just like that but it looks like i'm not the first one to have done that because there is a small drop of solder right there you can so, see that's happened once before on this one as well so let's see if i can get that to work again All right, let's see if it works. Bridge pickup. Middle. Neck. Crisis averted. <laughs> By the way, the reason why that happened is the pickup got spun around too many times. And since these don't have pull pieces one direction or the other, it's hard to know which way is the top or bottom originally. And that made the wire too short and then it sprung again. But it looks like both of those have been repaired previously anyway, so it's probably a good thing that was touched up. Control-wise, it's just a standard three-way toggle switch. You got neck, neck and middle, and bridge with a master volume and a master tone. Check your thumb bleeders out and your output jack on the front. This one does have some finish cracking here. But this guy has a three-piece maple body. I mean, it's pretty beautiful here. I mean, nothing crazy. It looks like maybe somebody spilled coffee on this at one point in time. I'm not sure what this is. Like, you can't really feel it, but you can kind of feel this, but it doesn't clean off or anything. And then that strip ends right here, and then you've got this large middle piece, which is where the string through part is. And then you have this section of the maple body. Now, underneath the pick guard, that's kind of interesting. I believe what they've done is at the factory or something like that, they used some sort of light adhesive glue before they drilled it into place. I mean, you saw me, This here's the instant replay. I had to use something to really pry this off. That's because of what I'm assuming is some type of glue. But here you can also see the original color of the instrument. It's just kind of a white natural finish and you can see how it's turned to more of an aged natural over the years. I'm very confident I am the first person to have taken this pick guard off. Moving on to the neck, it is 24 frets. And this thing was definitely somebody's player. Like to play between like the 5th and the 12th fret, you can see heavy usage marks here where the clear coat has been worn off. But this is probably somebody's gigging guitar. You have lots of fret wear on the top like 8 frets or so. You could probably do with a level recrown job to get rid of those. But we'll see how it plays once it's strung back up just as is. Face of the headstock, there is no veneer over this. So you can see all 5 pieces that make up the headstock, the 3 piece neck neck as well as the two wings there is a very minor separation here nothing that you really need to glue and clamp or anything but there and good to know you can also see the color difference here and the gibson logo it looks like it got dinged at one point in time and it kind of tore it a bit and here you can see a different set of tuners was on here at one point in time that used the large washers that's something you can never get rid of it's just kind of a shadow around the whole tuner not too bad in this case since it's just a bare maple color though these guys have the tiny nut widths 1.56 inches and it is 1.97 at the 12th they start off kind of small 0.82 but then they get kind of chunky, 0.98 at the 12. By 24 frets, it is still the standard 24 and 3 quarters inch Gibson scale. 
Here's what the back side of the bridge looks like. Sometimes you'll see made in Germany on these because they are Schaller made and they're referred to as the harmonica bridge. The truss rod cover on these is black and they're rather thick. I would say they're almost twice as thick as a regular truss rod cover. I mean, they're definitely more durable. Like a normal truss rod, you could snap it in half just with this pressure. So that's kind of a unique feature to these guys and they're just single ply instead of multi ply. Moving on to the back side here, this explains a little bit more about those pickups. So having these labels here, those were likely done after the fact, so that tells me those pickups have been in and out. I guess it's possible they're not the original pickups, but they are error correct. But we do have the original pots right here, and if we zoom in right here, you can see that these date to pretty late 1974. And since serial numbers don't necessarily tell you a whole lot in this era, that's the best way to date this guitar. So I would call it a late 74, early 75. But here again, you can see the three pieces of maple. You do have a comfort carve right here. It looks like some of the finish has been worn through in that area. And this is where the strings go through to go to the front. Bolt-on neck. The plate doesn't say anything fancy on it. Then this neck has a very slight separation. I'm not really even sure if I would call it a separation. This is more so just some dirt and crime has worked into the three piece neck, which makes it very visible. This is never gonna give you any issues, but it's definitely good to know that it's there. Other than that, the neck is straight. Truss rod adjusts just fine. You're good to go on this one. Back of the headstock, you can see somebody had shallers on here at one point in time. But this is back to what would have originally been on this instrument, the Gibson Deluxe Klusen style. Serial number for this one, 394888, made in USA. This example weighs just about eight pounds. Now, before we get into the playing demo, I do want to mention one thing that's wrong with this guitar. The tone pot must be going bad because if it's all the way at 10, it's like it's not even on. So it sounds like this. So kind of like it's at zero, but not quite, but it sounds full on around seven. So that's at eight. So, not sure what's going on there. You might want to replace that. much but 
this one sounds great. I mean, it's got a few quirks you gotta live with, but I can see why somebody played it for as long as they did. Now that we know how this one sounds, let's go ahead and review its condition. Face of the headstock, as we were talking earlier, the Gibson logo is a little bit damaged up here. You've got the rings from the other tuners that were on here. But truss rod functions just fine. It's nowhere near maxed out or anything like that. The nut is also in good shape. The frets, you might want to level recrown and dress them, but as far as I can tell, just strumming it. I don't see anything that really frets out or anything though, so you don't necessarily have to do that right away. I just cleaned off the fret board and polished those frets up, so you're good to go with that. Put a fresh set of 10 gauge strings on it. I mean, you've got lots of nicks and dings on the face of the instrument here. Again, you got the staining there, not really sure what that's about. But it presents well from the front, just those nicks and dings as we're talking about. Now, the pickup ring right here does have a chip off of it. And as we learned, the pickup connections have been touched up on these ones. But everything else is good as far as that goes. Back of the headstock, original tuners back on here, but you can see evidence of different tuners here. The back of the neck has very slight separation right here in the three-piece maple. I'm, good. I'm just going to advertise it as a slight separation, but I truly believe it's just dirt that's kind of worked its way in there as the finish has kind of been worn down. We'll probably see that in the blacklight test here. Bolt-on neck. I don't see any cracks in the pocket or anything. That's something you always got to check on these guys. But the back of the guitar, it's got some nicks and scratches, like buckle worm in here and there. But for the most part, we're pretty good. I would say the worst area is right here where the finish has kind of been rubbed through. We'll run it along the edges. Pretty similar wear. I mean, I wouldn't say this thing is trashed by any means, but it was definitely somebody's well-loved gigging guitar. Let's go ahead and pop over to the blacklight test. So here we go. You can see, once again, that staining we were talking about. You've got some edge wear to the finish, but no touch-ups that I'm seeing here. The knobs are definitely glowing original yet. Even the fretboard here, you can see the wear on the clear coat there. Personally, I don't like it when maple fretboards have that, but that's just me. But it also shows you when a guitar is a really good player because somebody used it a lot. Face of the headstock is looking great. And here you can see where all the sweatiness of the neck, why it glows a little bit more than the rest of the instrument, and where the finish has been worn off the neck a little bit. It is a little bit sticky, I won't lie to you. Consider just sanding it down a little bit to get rid of that if it bothers you. As far as that light separation, it's never gonna cause you any issues. But it is there and good to know about. On the backside, just what I was telling you about right there. Everything else is just, you know, what we already knew. So this thing is just in great shape. Great vintage shape. I wasn't provided a case with this one, so I went ahead and I gave it one of my Gibson gig bags. This is one of their older style ones. It has like a, uh, a grayish green interior. It's kind of cool. The only thing to really know about this one is the backside is incredibly sun faded. It's either that or somebody tried to do a bleach test with this to make it a different color. I don't know. It's TKL made. If you think you might be interested in being the next owner of this Gibson L6 Midnight Special, you can check that link in the description that will take you to the Reverb for Sale page. Thank you Troglodytes for watching, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care!